That's right, saints. Victory in Jesus, our Savior forever. Welcome back to week two. This is our second week of the Hillcrest Church of Christ virtual worship service. We thank you so much for tuning in last week. We thank you even more for tuning in today. Grab a pen, grab some paper, take some notes. You are in for an awesome word from the Lord. I'm going to trade my earthly home for a better one, bright and fair. Christ left to prepare a mansion for his children in the air. I'll join him in that land where tears, no sorrow can be found. And I'll receive my mansion, mansion, road, road and crown. The weather there is always fair, there is sunshine day and night. No cold and no rain will fall there, for the sun shines ever bright. I'll need no heavy garments, I'll just wrap my robe around. When I receive my mansion, mansion, robe, robe and crown. Mansion, robe and a crown. Please reserve my mansion, mansion, robe, robe and crown. My head's bowed and bloody now from the work I've tried to do. But one day I'll be rewarded with a crown so bright and new. I'll wear a smile so bright for there'll be no cause for a frown. When I receive my mansion, mansion, robe, robe and crown. Mansion, robe and a crown. Around. Lord, please reserve my mansion, mansion, robe, robe and crown, mansion, mansion, robe and a crown, and glory, fair love, love, always about forever, let me stay your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion, mansion, robe, robe and crown. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day, for another opportunity to get it right and to keep it right with you. We're so mindful of your kindness and your grace and your mercy and your unconditional love for us that you blessed us with the Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, dear Jesus, for interceding on our behalf. We cannot live this life without your help. And we thank you for this day. And we might ask this day that you forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. We ask you as we go through these issues and concerns of this nation of ours, with your people that are sick, and when or with this coronavirus, we know that all the power is in your hands, that you know the way from heaven to earth, back to heaven, and back to earth, where you've promised to come and take your people to spend eternity with you. We would ask that you would bless those that are sick and those that are shut in, those that have concerns about financial stability of their families and financial stability of this nation. Let those bring all those concerns and leave them at the foot of the cross where you gave your life on Calvary's cross for each and every one of us. We thank you again for just this day. We thank you for your unconditional love for us, that we always remember that the victory is in you, that we keep our eyes focused on you and focused on the cross, knowing that you are there for us. And again, you love us unconditionally. Thank you for the Hillcrest ministry Thank you for blessing us and all of our families. We just, again, just thank you unconditionally for all your love for us. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, Amen. The scripture for this morning is Matthew 6 verse 33 to 34 
NIV version. And the scripture reads, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Every praise is to our God, every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God, glory hallelujah is to our God. From the Lord. It was read into your hearing Matthew chapter 6 verses 33 and 34. But let me back up just a little bit because I need to give you a, a few additional scriptures that tie directly into the word for this morning. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Let's begin at verse number 25. This is coming from the New International Version translation and beginning at verse 25 the Bible says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You owe of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need of them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, 
and all of these things will be given to you as well. Verse 34 says, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Again, that is Psalms, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. And we are in the second week of this series, if you will, and we know that the world is still very cautious of this coronavirus and the rapid spread of this particular virus. And as I mentioned last week, more cases are showing up than ever before, even right here in our own backyard of Atlanta. Wherever you're tuning in right now, as you watch this sermon, undoubtedly you'll hear cases and, and find more and more cases showing up even right there in your own neighborhood, your county, your city, even in your state. It's no secret that this pandemic is great, it's a beast, it's huge, but the good news is Christ is bigger. I was once told that uh, never tell God how big your problems are, tell your problems how big your God is. And, and so in 1988, I believe it was, there was a man by the name of Bobby McFerrin and even Bob Marley released a song that I want to use for the title of this sermon this morning. And that title is nothing more than Don't Worry, Be Happy. Even inside of your homes right now, look at your husband and your wives and your kids and tell them, don't worry, be happy. And I think uh, this is a perfect title because far too many times we're too busy worrying about things that many of the times we, we can't even change. We just worry about things oftentimes for no reason. And in fact, in that very song, there's a line that says, in every life we have some trouble, but when we worry, you make it double. And so I think it's apparent that when these things happen in our lives that cause us to worry, it can create even more trouble for us the more that we worry about it. Now, I'm not here to downplay the severity of this situation. I'm not here to say don't take this coronavirus seriously. What I am here to say is that we are worrying about something that God already has under control. God is already in the healing business. God is in the blessing business. And so the things that we worry about, God is already in control of. In fact, I would even venture to say that worrying has done more damage to people than a virus could ever do. I would even say that worrying occupies more time throughout most of the day that we have. Worrying can add so much stress. Worrying can add so much weight to our shoulders, so much unnecessary stress that we carry. But watch this. Far beyond its, its psychological effect is how the Bible describes worrying to be a sin for the child of God. Worrying is almost equivalent to saying, Lord, I know, I know you mean well by what you say, but I just, I, I'm just not sure that you can pull it off. And you'll find out in today's lesson that worrying, in fact, is the opposite of trusting God. And so since worrying is, if we could be honest, such a major part of our daily lives when it shouldn't be, but it is, let's be honest, let me tell you today three things about this idea of worrying. The first one is, I want to teach you, I want to show you exactly how worrying is developed. I also want to show you how worrying is described according to the text. And then here's the good news. I want to end with how worrying could be defeated by the people of God. How it's described, how it's developed, how it can be defeated. Let's get right into the text. Let's get right into the first point. The first thing is how worrying is truly developed. Quite often we find ourselves worrying about matters that we don't need to worry about at all. In fact, let me give you some numbers here on the screen so that you can see them. 40% of the things that we worry about typically never even happen. 30% of the things that we worry about are things that occurred in the past and that are long gone. 12% of the things that we worry about typically is over health issues. 10% of what we worry about is considered to be over 
petty stuff. And then finally, 8% of the worrying that we do, people say, are over real legitimate issues. I feel like we're spending far too much time on Anxiety Avenue and far too much time on Worrying Way, and we need to spend some time on Trusting Terrace. Some of y'all missed that one. Now, back in our text, we see that this idea of worrying, here's how it's developed. According to the Bible, worrying is developed by thinking. Now, let me let that pause for a quick second for you. Simply by thinking is what typically will cause some worrying. Let me give you the Bible to how I know that is true. If you look at verse 25 again, the Bible says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat and drink or about your body and what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. So worrying happens when we begin to think, or if I can say this word, overthink certain things or certain situations. Let me give you an example. As soon as we heard about this pandemic coming, especially to Georgia or wherever you are tuning in from, we rushed to the grocery store, we rushed to the aisles, and we took all the bread and we took all of the chicken and all of the toilet paper. Even to this day, you can't find toilet paper anywhere in your local grocery store. Why? Because we started to think about the worst case scenario and it caused us to begin to worry. It caused us to begin to think, well, what if we run out of food at home? And what if we run out of toilet paper? And what if we run out of all of the necessities of life at home? And that thinking caused you to begin to worry. What are you saying, Brother Salary? That worrying is developed by thinking or in, in all honesty, in overthinking certain situations. Then in verse 25, it, it talks more about how we're too busy trying to expand our wardrobe. We're too busy worrying about the clothes that we have and looking nice and making sure we have all of the things we want. And not just us, but sometimes even our own kids. We're too busy trying to focus on little Johnny, making sure little Johnny has every single thing he needs so that he can fit in with the people at school. And some of y'all will stand in lines for hours on Saturday morning to, to get the latest Michael Jordan shoe to make sure little Johnny doesn't have this FOMO, which is the, the fear of missing out. We want to make sure our kids are, are laced and suited and booted for school to make sure that they have the latest and greatest of whatever is out there for them to have. And as a result, it's causing us to worry because we think of things like, well, what if little Johnny doesn't have the same shoes as his classmate? And what if little Johnny doesn't have all of the latest fashion that is going on in this world? And that overthinking is causing us to worry. Again, what are you saying to me, brother salary? How do you know what I'm thinking right now? Because worrying is developed by overthinking certain things. Let me draw your attention here in verse 27. The Bible says, can it ask you a question? It says, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Look at the question. Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Now, don't get me wrong. Your future is very important. But when that's all that we are concerned about is causing us to worry and that worrying becomes a problem because Worry has the potential to divide the mind and multiply your misery. Worrying has the potential to subtract from your happiness, but it never adds to it. And so all I'm here to offer to you this morning is that worrying is overrated. It's unproductive. All it is doing is distracting you from the bigger picture, with this, which is God. What am I saying to you? It does nothing good to you. Worrying is developed by overthinking. And so you might be saying, all right, brother salary, I get it. If, if, if this idea of worrying is developed by thinking or overthinking, well, how is it described in the Bible? And let me give you some Bible. Here's, here's your second point. Here's the second idea under this, this title of don't worry, be happy. We've already talked about how worrying is developed. Now let me show you what the Bible or how rather the Bible describes this thing called worry. Here in the text, if you read, Jesus describes worrying in three different ways. I don't want you to miss this. In three different ways 
Jesus is describing what worrying is or does to the person. Here's the first one that he describes. Worrying is unbecoming. Let me just pause here for a second because I really need you to write that down. Text it in your phone, write it on your notes, whatever you have to take your notes on. I need you to understand that worrying is described in the Bible first by being unbecoming. In other words, it's, it's inconsistent or it doesn't mesh well with your faith. So if you look again back in verse number 25, it says, is life not more important than food and the body more important than clothes. What I gather from this is if God provided life, don't miss this point, if God is the one that provided life, will he not provide the necessities that life has to, uh, that, that life requires? Let me give it to you again. If life is created by God and God knew everything he was doing when he created life, who are we to think that he might have left out some of the important details that fall under this thing called life? Do we really believe that God would create something so major and then forget about some of the minor details about clothes and food and things that we constantly worry about every single day? So I'm here to tell you that worrying is unbecoming. Now, the second way that it's described in the Bible is it is described as being unnecessary. All right, don't miss this. Worrying is not only described as being unbecoming, but it's described as being unnecessary. And I'm going to show you that right now. If you look at the text in verse number 26, the text says, look at the birds of the air. It says they, they, don't, sow, they don't sow, they don't reap. They don't store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Then it asks the question, are you not much more valuable than they? Talking about the birds. And so what am I talking about here? Worrying is unnecessary because all of the things that we worry about in life, we read that God will supply all of our needs. Let me give you an example because I need to make it realistic to you. In the salary household, in my house, the kids never have to wonder or worry about where their next meal is coming from. All right, don't miss this. I'm trying to give you this analogy. They, they never have to wonder where the next meal is coming from. Don't miss this point. Because they trust their father to take care of the necessities. All right, don't miss this. And, and they never have to wonder where their clothes are coming from because they trust my wife. To, to take care of the clothes and the shopping. And so what I'm saying to you is that my, my three kids never have a worry and thought enter their mind because of the trust that they have in their father. And so I'm trying to speak to someone right now, all of the things that you're worrying about, your father already knows the needs that you have. And he'll take care of every single thing that you have. So there is no need to worry. What am I saying to you? Like Bob Marley said many years ago, don't worry be happy. So not only is worrying unbecoming, not only is it unnecessary, but the third way that the Bible describes it is as unproductive. This is one, this is the part I like. Don't miss this. Worrying is unproductive. And again, in verse 27, the great question was asked, can any one of you, can anybody out there add a single hour to your life by worrying. All right, I'm trying to show you how it's unproductive. And so you can worry about things, but it, it, it doesn't do anything productive for you. Let me ask you, have you ever seen, have you ever seen these mice or these, these gerbils that, that get in this, the, the wheel in their cage and they, just, and they just spin and spin and run all day long? Seems like for hours, they just spin in this will that they have in their cage. And when it comes to worrying, it's the same analogy or the same thing for us. We can do it all day long, but at the end of the day, you didn't accomplish anything by, by worrying. Just like that mice or, or, or that, that mouse, excuse me, or that gerbil can run all day, but at the end, they didn't leave from that same position they were in. It's almost like they're just going in circles. And the same is true for us. So I'm here to remind you this morning that worrying is truly unproductive. 
It'll wear you tired. It'll wear you down. You'll be sick to your stomach. At the end of the day, focusing and worrying about things that you and I don't have the ability to change anyway. So I need you to understand that the Bible describes worrying to be unproductive, to be unnecessary, and also to be unbecoming. Now let me give you, let me give you the good news. Here's the good news. Here's what you've been waiting on. I've already told you how, how worrying is developed, and that's by overthinking. I, I just showed you three different ways that the Bible describes worrying, and that's, and that's unbecoming, unproductive, and certainly unnecessary. Now, I need to give you the good news, which is how worry can be defeated. I know that's why you're tuning in. You're trying to find out, Brother Saller, I've been worrying about this thing. My family, we've been running our, ourselves tired, trying to focus on how do we, how do we overcome this, this, this coronavirus, this sickness? How do we deal with this beast that's spreading throughout the world? And here is your, your shout. Here's what you've been waiting on this entire time, which is how we can defeat worry. Christ is telling us to stop worrying, even in times like these, we ought to stop worrying. Here's how you can defeat worrying. Don't miss this. Three different ways that we find here in the text, and it lists all of them right here in our scripture. Three different ways that you and I can defeat this thing called worry. Here's the first one. I like this one. The first way that we can defeat worry is through faith. All right, even while you're on the uh, laying in your bed or on the comfort of your couch, I want you to repeat after me. We can defeat worry through faith. And that's the first way that the Bible is showing us that we can do this. Here's why I know this to be true. Look at how Christ described those folks that worry. Don't miss this. In verse 30, it says that if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, the Bible says, will he not much more clothe you? Then it says, O oh, ye of little faith. And so how do we defeat worry, brother salary? The first way is through faith. You have to have faith. Why? Because if you are too busy worrying about things that are stressing you out, then you don't have time to exercise the faith that we all should have in Christ. So the first principle, the first idea to defeating this thing is called having faith. Here's the second way that we can defeat worrying, and it, and it is through prioritizing your life. Don't miss this point. We have to prioritize what's important in our life. If, if the worrying that we are doing is taking precedence, is number one in our lives, then you don't have time to focus on anything else. And I'm going to show you how the Bible says the one surefire way to defeat worrying is through prioritizing your life. Look at verse 33. Verse 33 is one of the, uh, one of the famous verses we can all probably quote. And it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all of these things will be added unto you. Look at the very first part of that verse. But seek ye first. And so the Bible is reminding us that with all of the worry that's going on in the world, your first priority needs to be seeking God and his righteousness. I understand it's a scary time that we're living in. I understand that it's a, a time of uncertainty. I understand that even sometimes your own neighbors, your own coworkers, maybe many folks in your own family have come in contact with this coronavirus. And it's a time of, of nervousness and anxiety. I get it. But the Bible is saying, uh, amidst of all of the stuff that's going on in the world, the Bible says, seek ye first. In other words, all of the stuff that you're focusing on, the very first thing should be seeking Christ and his righteousness. And I love that when you, when you prioritize things in your life, you'll, you'll notice that every single thing else fails in comparison to Christ. And what you'll notice is when you prioritize with Christ being number one, the Bible says all of these other things will be added unto you. So I need you to understand that when it comes to, to defeating this thing called worry, you have to do it through faith. You have to put Christ first 
But here's the last, here's the last way that we can defeat worry. The last and final way is by focusing on the now. Don't miss this. Focusing on today. Don't worry about what next week will bring. Don't worry about what tomorrow will bring. Don't worry about when your job is going to let you come back in to work. Don't worry about when them kids are going to leave your house and stop eating all your groceries. The Bible is saying worry about today. Here's how I know that to be true. Verse 34 says, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Then it says, each day has enough trouble of its own. So while we're so focused on what will happen tomorrow, we're missing the opportunity to focus on God today. I don't want you to miss that. Don't focus on what will happen in the next 24 hours. Focus on the time that Christ has given us right now. Now, the Bible is saying tomorrow already has its own set of problems that we'll have to deal with when we cross that bridge. But while we have today, focus on what we can do today to defeat the worry. Let me end this sermon by saying this. When we focus on the problem, what tends to happen is that we lose focus on the problem solver. And Christ is already here and in control of every single thing that's going on. I told you last week in the first virtual worship service about the cause and the cure. And I told you the reason why this thing is happening is according to the Bible, we have sinned and uh, com uh, committing evil acts against Christ. And so that's the cause. I told you the cure is returning back to Christ. And so when it comes to uh, this problem that we're facing, if we focus on the problem, then we're not focusing on the problem solver. And this thing will never get any better than what it is now. Again, as I mentioned to you earlier this morning, Bobby McFerrin and Bob Marley once said, don't worry, be happy. They said in every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Saints, I need you to understand that according to the Bible, it talks about how worrying is developed, which is through overthinking. It talks about how worrying is described, which is unbecoming, unproductive, and unnecessary. And then it talks about how worrying is defeated, and that's through having faith, through putting, through putting Christ first, and through focusing on today. Even in times like today, we need to have a spirit of don't worry, be happy. As you watch this service from your home, as you tune in from around the states, from around the country, from around the globe, wherever you are right now, I, I want you to respond to this invitation that is uh, about to happen, about to be placed here on the screen. I want you to understand that Christ wants us to be happy. Christ wants us not to worry. Christ wants us to focus on us. And I need to give you a few more things uh, to consider before we wrap up this sermon this morning. The first one is hearing. The Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the first thing is, do you hear? Are you hearing the word of God? After you have heard the message, then the next step is you have to believe the word. You have to believe that which you have heard. After you have believed, you can then repent, which is turning away, not reporting. You have to repent of those sins that we have been committing that is causing separation from Christ. After we have heard, believed, repent, now we're ready to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and then we can baptize you even today. Yes, even as you are at home in your pajamas, sitting on your couch, we have made provisions for you to be baptized today. You have to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And after you are baptized, the Bible says you will remain, or you shall remain steadfast even unto death. That means staying involved. That means staying active. That means staying faithful. That means not falling by the wayside, but staying committed to seeking his face daily. Saints, if you're tuning in right now and you are in need of prayer, I want you to understand that we have uh, some options available for you for you to get prayed for. 
Like I told you last week, maybe you're currently going through a difficult time and you need someone to pray for your situation. Maybe you have been let go from your job. Maybe your pay has been cut. Maybe things in your household are starting to become uneasy and you just stand in the need of prayer. We want to pray for you and with you today. If you're subject to the invitation, if you realize that through this message, you realize that you stand a guilty distance from Christ and you want to make today the day that you get yourself together and right with Christ, we can even make that happen for you today. If you're in need of prayer, I want you to know that you can call the church, call Hillcrest Church of Christ, and that number is 404-289-4573. And you can select option four. When you select option four, it rings directly to the elder's phone. And we have elders that are standing by ready to take your phone call for your prayer request today. You can also text your prayer request to 678-492-0769. If you don't want to pick up the phone to call Text your prayer request and one of our elders that is standing by will call you back and pray with you and for you on the phone. And as I mentioned earlier, if you subject to the invitation and you're ready to put on Christ in the watery grave of baptism, you'll be happy to know that we have elders at the building right now. They will be able to assist you between uh, the hours of, of, of about 10, about now, through about 2 o'clock p.m., and they are able to baptize you today. I told you folks last week, this is a very serious pandemic, but we know who we put our trust in. Don't let another day go by without getting yourself right with Christ. Make sure you call today so that we can pray for you and or baptize you today. And remember, God loves you. And Hillcrest loves you too. Just as I am without one plea, but that I God was shed for me, and that thou gavest me home to me.
And now we've come to the portion of the service known as giving. First, let me just say thank you so much for those that have already given this week. Many of you have driven to the building to drop off your contribution. For those that have yet to do so, no worries. You still have plenty of time and plenty of ways. What you'll notice here on the screen is that we've provided four different ways that you can give. As you know, Hillcrest still has responsibilities even during these tough times. You can give via our P.O. Box. You can also give via the mobile app. You can text the number on your screen there to give. Or finally, you can give via the website, which is hillcrestcoc.net. And even really a fifth way is the elders are here today at the building that if you would like to ride by to drop off your offering, you can do so as well. Now concerning the collection, I want to draw your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the verses number one and number two. The Bible says now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saying it up, excuse me, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Join me in prayer for the collection. Father God, we are so thankful that you have allowed us to have an income, to have money, to have funds coming in so that we can take care of our household, our families, and ourselves, and the necessities of life. But we are so thankful that we also have the opportunity to give back a portion of that which you have so richly blessed us with. Lord, everyone under the sound of my voice, I ask that you bless us and be with us at this time that we give not not grudgingly or of necessity, but we give because we know, Father God, you love a cheerful giver. It is in your son's name we pray and we give thanks. Amen. Alas, and did my Savior me, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred hand for one so low as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. This brings us down to the communion part of our services. As you remember, the last time we met virtually, we partake of the communion. And the question is asked, why do we take the communion service every first day of the week? The Old Covenant worship day was on Saturday. The New Covenant worship day is the day Jesus was raised from the dead, which was Sunday. On the first day of the week, we are able to remember the Lord's death until he comes. This is why we take the Lord's Supper. I want you to read with me, if you were able to, Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 to 28. The Bible says, For I receive of the Lord, which also I deal unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he supped, saying, This cup is New Testament in my blood. This do ye often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, ye shall show the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord, unworthy shall be gift of the Lord's body until the Lord come. Listen to Paul's uh, address in regard to the Lord's Supper. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of this bread and drink of this cup. For he to eat and drink it unworthy, eat and drink it, damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Will you pray with me at this time for the loaf and the cup? Our God and our Father, we adore you and we thank you so much for 
align your darling son to down the cross of Calvary that we may have a right to the tree of life. Thank you so much for the death, burial, and resurrection. After that, we're obedience, we're recipients of the gospel. The gospel that allows us to be recipients of grace, love, mercy, and acceptance, and forgiveness, and salvation. Father, we thank you so much for the body that was hung on the cross that represents the church. We thank you so much for the blood that was shed on our behalf. That same blood that we contact through baptism that washes away our sins. That same blood that we're recipients of that allows us to walk in the light as he is in light. We have fellowship one with another. That same blood that you purchased your church. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to think about what Jesus has done for us in the past, now, and what he has promised to do for us in the future. We love you and we thank you so much. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, may we all together say amen. Now you may partake of the loaf. And now you may take up, partake of the cup. Say hallelujah to the Lamb. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Saints, thank you so much for tuning in this morning. This was our second Hillcrest Church of Christ virtual worship service. We pray and we hope and we trust that you were blessed by the service this morning. Here's what will happen in the next couple of days. Stay by your phone. You'll receive a call from one of our elders via the phone tree. You may receive an email. You may receive a text. And this will be regarding our plans to meet next week and the following and so forth. So stay by your phone or you can even visit our website for information as well. Again, that's hillcrestcoc.net. Remember, God loves you. Hillcrest loves you as well. And now our closing prayer. Let us pray. Father, as we bow our heads, we are thankful to be able to call you Father. And as we come to a close of this worship service on this Lord's Day, we thank you once again. Father, in the world that we live in now, we're experiencing uh, all kinds of trouble, but we look to you for strength and guidance in all we do. We pray a special prayer for, Father, our government, our leaders. We pray a special prayer, particularly for God's people that leads his people, the leaders of the church, for not only just here, Chris, but throughout the world. We pray that we'll be an example of what God would have us all do. Father, we pray that as we continue to worship you in these innovative ways, that, Father, your word will be reached out to many. We just pray, Lord, that you continue to bless each family and voice that hear us on this broadcast today. Just continue to bless everybody, Father. And we pray the things that were said by our brother Tori and Sari, where will help us all get through these challenges in the days ahead. Father, thank you for loving us and thank you for protecting us and continue to protect all of us. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Lay, lay, blue, blue, yo, yo, ha, ha, lay.